Uh, I had the opportunity to spend uh, the day uh, working with community leaders, faith leaders, uh, working with advocates, and working with members of our own National Guard to help uh, clean up the streets of Sacramento. Uh, randomly had the privilege and opportunity to meet up with a, a group of young people around the police officer's memorial that were cleaning up graffiti. Uh, a young girl, uh, quite literally with one lung, uh, that outlasted all of us as she was scrubbing away for hours and hours and hours. No one asked her to do it. Uh, it was just an act of random kindness and a recognition uh, that her community was being impacted and her life and her future impacted by the moment. And she wanted to uh, impact uh, the community in a positive way. She, by the way, was also part of the protest the night before, but didn't like certain aspects of what she saw. I had the privilege of uh, also working not only side by side with her, uh, but uh, with Stevante Clark, a well-known activist here in the Sacramento region, uh, who also was working to clean up graffiti on the side of a state building. Both of us turned uh, our heads to the right, and randomly we saw a member of our National Guard put down his weapon, unbeknownst to the two of us and others, uh, and was scrubbing side by side uh, with others, uh, graffiti off the side of a building. I had the chance to fly down to South LA, in the center of so much of the violence and protests and outrage uh, in 1992. Uh, went down uh, with County Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas went down with the chair of our budget committee, Senator Holly Mitchell, uh, met with members and leaders in the community, just randomly walked the streets, checked in on how people were feeling. Uh, none of the protests, none of the violence manifesting uh, down in South LA. We talked about why that was the case. We learned about the history of institutional building, uh, not just physical infrastructure, but human capital, human infrastructure, uh, the resolve uh, that people had to never again see what occurred in 1992 occur again in South LA. I had the chance to visit members of law enforcement, visit with community leaders, including one of my heroes. I'm here at the California uh, Museum. It's also the home of the California Hall of Fame of some of the most inspired leaders that have left their mark on history that happened to uh, have a strong identity here in the state of California. One of them that I had the privilege uh, of uh, recognizing just a few months ago was Revan Lawson, known to many uh, as one of the most influential leaders in the civil rights movement. He brought back forth the principles of nonviolence uh, from Gandhi and brought them to the forefront of the consciousness of Dr. King. Uh, we met with him and leaders of Black Lives Matter, other leaders in the community, and had a conversation about the history of the civil rights movement. Going back, as we debated, uh, to the 1950s, he argued back to 1947 and the impact Jackie Robinson had on the movement, not just Emmett Till and that moment that marked uh, a part of history that changed the momentum, Montgomery bus boycott, others that he organized and helped lead. What makes this moment different from that moment? Is this a moment or is this a movement? What part of our history are, are we living in and living through? Had the opportunity to meet with uh, many youth leaders. And I'll tell you of all the conversations I've had over the course of the last week in particular, it's the clarity and conviction of our youth. They don't mince words. They don't beat around the bush. They don't, they don't they're not patient. And they're not necessarily confident that folks in position like mine get it or have the capacity to get it done. They have no reservoir of patience. They demand progress. They demand people in position of power and influence to listen, but more important than anything else, they demand that people in power, position, and influence lead, lead demonstrably, lead with courage, lead with conviction. But they also made a point, lead with civility. They pointed out a number of these youth leaders that violence has solved nothing, it's created nothing, there's nothing 
courageous about violent acts. I was reminded a little bit of what Kennedy spoke to, that no wrong has ever been righted by violence. To hear that from youth, youth leaders leading protests in their community, peaceful protests, was humbling and also enlivening because they want this moment to be met with a deeper sense of urgency and they want their cause to be clear. It's a cause of peace, a cause of progress and that violence has no place as it relates to meeting this moment and moving that collective cause forward. One thing I came back with, not only time on the streets in Sacramento, in South LA, in Stockton, California, uh, with a young leader, Mayor uh, Tubbs, and many other youth leaders that he assembled, is that the black community, black community does not need to change. We need to change. We have a responsibility to change. Our institutions need to change. Our capacity of understanding needs to change. We need to contextualize not only this moment, but moments in the past where we never met these calls and these cries, that we ran short. We ran long on rhetoric, short on results. Again, there's no reservoir for patience. That's self-evident just on your TV screen, but it's also self-evident in the minds and hearts and the values that you hear from people all across this state and all across the United States of America. This has been an extraordinary week in our nation's history and the history of the state of California. Uh, and we have a unique and special responsibility here in California to meet it and to meet it head on. I'm also here at the California Museum for another reason, because I was here roughly a year ago where California was demonstrably leading incredible leadership that was assembled uh, just downstairs from where I am here today, where we signed landmark bill, the nation's toughest use of force laws on deadly force. AB 392 in the lexicon of the legislature, led by Dr. Shirley Weber, leaders like McCarty, many others, that led an effort to reconcile our antiquated practices as it relates to use of force. It was a controversial bill. There was previous efforts to advance the bill. They fell short. But assembled were not only elected officials, but leaders of all stripes, people that exercise every single day their moral authority that helped create the conditions that led to the advancement of that landmark effort. Leaders who lost loved ones, leaders that were still cynical but willing to participate at this moment in hope and expectation that we can do more than just pass a program, but we can fundamentally solve a problem. And I am here today to say that program passing is indeed not problem solving unless we follow through on what we promote and promise and we manifest a cultural change and a deeper understanding of what it is that we're trying to advance. We passed that bill last August but it hasn't stopped violence, it hasn't stopped the mistrust, it hasn't stopped people from raising anxiety. We're seeing there's anxiety raised and concerns being brought to the forefront. We have so much work still left to do. There was a companion bill that was also part of that package, SB 230, that had deep frame of focus on implicit bias training, de-escalation, techniques. So many of the provisions of that bill, interestingly, go into effect in January 2021. That cannot happen soon enough. We're scrubbing components of that bill to see if we can fast track and concentrate uh, some of those provisions to advance the cause uh, that brought us together on that bill uh, and move forward with a greater sense of urgency. I say that to reflect uh, on a point and uh, a point of optimism and also frustration that California has been leading, but still we haven't done enough. I say this all the time. Success is not a place or a definition. It's a direction. There is no having made it as it relates to addressing these foundational and fundamental issues. We have extraordinary amount of work left to do. I'm proud of 
this state and proud of the cause of reform that goes beyond just the issue of implicit bias and de-escalization. It goes beyond just the issues of deadly use of force. I we're very proud of this state and the leadership that we advance to begin anew a conversation about broader criminal justice reform to address the issues of the war on drugs and the disparities, the race-based sentencing, the five-year minimum mandatory sentences that not too long ago were part and parcel of the culture of enforcement and ultimately as it relates to sentencing. Five-year mandatory sentence for having possession of five grams of crack cocaine for those with possession of powder cocaine it took 5,000 grams of cocaine to have the same five-year minimum mandatory sentence. 5,000 to one ratio of disparity. I remember the Clinton administration knocked that down to 500 to one. The Obama administration knocked it down further, but disparity still persists, not just as it relates to the consequences of drug possession, but across the criminal justice system. That's why the state was one of the early adopters of a new approach as it relates to cannabis reform and legal around adult use of marijuana. It was a civil rights call from our perspective. I was proud to be out in front in those efforts. It was about addressing the disparities. It was about addressing incarceration. And it was about addressing the ills of this war on drugs. But again, it's not enough. We are proud of the work we've done in the state of California. We announced and the legislature has embraced the need to shut down state prisons in our current budget that I will sign in just a few weeks. It calls for shutting down two state prisons. It calls for eliminating the Department of Juvenile Justice. It calls for more probation reforms. All of this building on the work that we've done on Prop 57, Prop 47, Prop 36, the work we continue to do in this state to end the death penalty in the state of California. I was proud to sign an executive order on a moratorium on the death penalty because one thing we know about our criminal justice system, it's not blind. It discriminates based on the color of your skin, discriminates based on wealth. It has been said over and over again, it cannot be said enough. We have a criminal justice system. I don't think this, I know this. As governor, I live this every day, a criminal justice system that treats people that are rich and guilty a hell of a lot better than it treats people that are poor and innocent. You know that and I know that. So why aren't we doing something? about it. We're trying our best here in the state, but we have to do more, still better. And I understand this conversation that we need to be having in the state of California just cannot be about criminal justice. It has to be about economic justice, social justice, environmental justice. It has to be so much richer and deeper than it's been in the past. That's why we created that Surgeon General position in the state of California, to begin to focus on the issues that manifest early in life, prenatal care, the focus on ACEs and early childhood trauma, focusing on prenatal care as well as preschool, early Head Start, not just Head Start, focusing on achievement gap before it manifests because at the end of the day, we can consume ourselves with achievement gap, but we know that people aren't left behind in society, they start behind in society. So if we're gonna get serious about addressing these disparities, then we've got to get serious about our work in that space as well. And we have committed ourselves to that cause. To education reform. My gosh, 10% of black students, 10% of black students met the state benchmarks on math proficiency last year. 10% by eighth grade. All of the disruption around COVID-19 and learning loss study just came out today. It should be seared in your minds and consciousness. A study that came out today that says the average learning loss in this nation because of COVID-19 is seven months. But for the black community, 10.3 months. For low income community, over one year of learning loss because of the impacts of COVID-19. You think we got an achievement gap right now? What are we going to do about that? And by the way, I just want to be clear and respectful at the same time to California legislature. One thing we're not going to do is take the $4.4 billion that we promoted in our budget and dilute it by taking it away from concentration funding 
for black and brown communities and those that are former foster youth and low income and English as second learners. I will reject any proposal that comes out of the legislature that does that. We are committed to the cause of equity. And that's the reason we put that $4.4 billion in the budget to focus on equity. And Governor Brown said it better than any of us. There is no equal application in unequal systems. You can't just spread that money out equally. We need to concentrate its focus. And I just want to make that clear as responsibly and respectfully I can to the legislature. I won't budge on that budget proposal. We have to do more and better, not just in education, not just addressing issues as it relates to birth and zero to five, but we also have to start thinking more systemically, more broadly about income supports. We're proud in this state to have doubled our earned income tax credit, proud in this state to begin the process of doing more on child care and empowering caregivers by organizing caregivers and giving them the power and capacity, their voice to lead, to focus on pay equity, all of these issues. I, I can go on and on, except to say that we're seeding a lot of these things in the state of California, but it's not enough. We have work to do, and we have a responsibility to do more than we have in the past. And so I want to make clear that those efforts must continue, and we must double down, and we must recognize those gaps uh, that continue to persist in the state and this nation. And so today I, I want to make a few announcements in terms of advancing that cause of recognition, understanding, uh, and resolve. One thing that is crystal clear to me, uh, having seen images uh, that inspired me of peaceful protests, that protesters have the right not to be harassed. Protesters have the right to protest peacefully. Protesters have the right to do so without being arrested, gassed, be shot at by projectiles. That's a simple value statement. I want to make that crystal clear. They have the right not to be harassed, not to be denied, not to be arrested for peaceful protesting, period, full stop. But it's clear on the images we see on TV, on the reality of a grandmother in La Mesa, California, that's in the hospital, that some people are denied that fundamental right. And then we're not seeing people treated equally all across the state of California. Now, we have rules and regulations, the California Highway Patrol, as it relates to how we use projectiles and how we use tear gas and how we use force to protect the peace. Not deadly force in this case, but broadly. National Guard has a frame. But municipalities have different approaches. And it's clear to me that we need to standardize those approaches. And so I have had the privilege, and you'll have the opportunity uh, to hear from two extraordinary leaders that I've known for years uh, and have been admiring uh, in terms of their leadership. One is Latifah Simon, social justice warrior, who's been on the front lines of this cause for years and years, and Ron Davis, who was a former captain in the Oakland Police Department for many, many years and chaired Barack Obama, was the executive director of Barack Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force that put out a report on reforming these tactics. And he, to his credit, is going to advise our efforts with the Latifa, working with journalists, working with advocates, working with law enforcement, together collectively to standardize our approach of engagement and to begin to address what we are seeing with our own eyes and people are experiencing all across the state and this nation as it relates to the disparities of approaches uh, that exist around peaceful protesting and how we control crowds in a responsible way that protects people's fundamental constitutional rights and protects people's safety at the same time. And so you'll hear from them, and I am very pleased at their commitment uh, to this cause and their resolve to advise us and to move forward very deliberative speed with recommendations to standardize these approaches uh, in the very, very near term. Accordingly, it is, goes without saying, we cannot see 
the kind of techniques that tragically and ironically we train. I own this. We own this. Across this country, we train techniques on strangleholds that put people's lives at risk. Now, we can argue that these are used as exceptions, but at the end of the day, a carotid hold that literally is designed to stop people's blood from flowing into their brain, that has no place any longer in 21st century practices and policing. And so I am immediately directing POST, which is our uh, police officers training to end the training of that practice. And I could not be more pleased, no sooner did we make a commitment on this proposal that a member of the legislature, Mike Gibson, to his credit, just introduced a piece of legislation that I will support and sign as soon as it gets to my desk to legislatively end that practice in the state of California. We did that years and years ago as it relates to chokeholds, decades ago, understandably, but not some of these techniques on strangleholds, and we have got to update our practices in that place as well. So that we will do immediately with a deep sense of urgency as well as we organize a new construct on how we focus on crowd control and help support, support peaceful protesting in the state and continue our leadership to be a model for the rest of the nation. This has been a very difficult time, I know, for all of us. And I just want to express, in particular, deep, deep respect for those remarkable leaders that are out there on the streets demanding that this be a moral moment and that we meet this moment and that we do so not because it's just the right thing to do, but it does justice to the promise what we promote. Because one thing is clear to me, we have a hierarchy of values in this country that diminishes certain people based on their color of the skin. And we have perpetuated that hierarchy for centuries in this state. And we need to own up to that. And we need to foundationally rip that out of its root. When we talk about institutional Racism, that's what we're talking about. And we become most numb to it, blind to it. No one wants to go back to normalcy. If you want to go back to normalcy, I'm not going there with you. I don't want to go back to normalcy. I want something better. We deserve something more. Generation of young people demand something better and something more. Please resist normalcy. Normalcy created the conditions that led to this moment. Normalcy has no place in terms of our reconciliation of this moment. We have to meet a higher calling. We are so much better than this, so much more capable than this. We will rise up to this moment. We will lead and we will listen and we will begin to reconcile but with resolve and a commitment and a persistence, not patience, that is demanding of this moment. And we will lead guided by people like Ron and Latifa and many, many others that have been on the front lines. And with that, I want to now just turn over this mic to Latifa uh, to talk a little bit more about what she hopes to accomplish, what she's been doing and how she hopes to work with Ron Davis and others uh, will advise us with the urgency that's needed at this moment to move in a direction uh, that does justice uh, to those cries uh, that we are loudly hearing in the state of California. Latifa. Thank you, Governor. My name is Latifa Simon, um, the president of the Akhenati Foundation, which is one of the state's first philanthropic institutions directly aimed at ending racialized injustice in the state of California. I also have the great pleasure of serving as the president of the board of directors for Bay Area Rapid Transit. But I come today not only with those roles, but after 25 years of working literally on the streets and in jails and in prisons for folks, many who have been denied justice. I'm hoping that I bring the spirit of the activists and organizers that I am currently learning from and have been learning from and the mothers that I'm learning from 
who are calling for an end of unjust violence by the state. This inflection moment in this country and frankly around the world suggest that we get it right, that we identify this moment for what it is, a sea change in facing race and racism and deep injustice, and the work that we will do together will not simply be folks around the table. This call that the governor is asking us all now to accept is to rapidly bend the arc towards justice. It is our duty, and we must move forward expeditiously. No more. We can't go back. So for those men and women for decades and literally centuries who have been calling and demanding a shift, we owe them. We owe them. The shift in this state, the state will come first, and so goes the nation. 392. Governor mentioned it. He signed one of the country's most sweeping acts of legislation to direct a change in culture. And now we must move. Dr. Shelley Weber worked with women in communities all throughout the state who had to bury their sons, unarmed sons, to create and craft those words that are now law in the state of California. We've all watched the tape of the murder of Mr. Floyd. And we do this work in his daughter's name. We do the work that we will move forward in the names of men and women who want to do the right thing and uphold the sanctity of life for all of California. I'm ready to work. I'm ready to work. Hold us to task. We can change and swiftly enact a culture that refutes that false promise, that false promise, or that false choice that we can't have it both ways. We can end racial injustice, although change is not swift, it is rough, it is dirty oftentimes, and it's difficult, but we'll get there. I'm very excited to work with Ron Davis, who is a national champion for police reform in advising the governor. And we will work with other stakeholders swiftly with this office and with law enforcement to not only shift the conversation, but shift the practice. We do this work in the honor of justice. I'm very excited to begin this process. Let's go. Good afternoon. Uh, let me start by first thanking the governor for his leadership. What I really appreciated with his opening remarks was the candor and the truth that he told us about who we are, who we have been, and where we need to go. I think the governor recognizes that too often the truth does hurt. Too often the truth is uncomfortable. But even though the truth hurts, selective ignorance is fatal. We ignore the truth, we make mistakes. We ignore the truth, we threaten our very existence. We threaten this democracy, the state, the nation. And so we have to start with the truth and understand that the systems that the governor is talking about are not broken. They're in many cases operating as designed and we need to have new ones. That's why I really appreciated the idea of not going back to normalcy but moving forward. I'm honored to be able to provide advice that I think I bring a very perspective and it's personal for me. One, as you can see, I'm standing here as an African American male and know what it's like to be a black man in America. And when I'm not, when I was a cop and I was not in uniform, what it's like to see a police car behind you. Know what it's like when I have three kids to have to tell all three of my kids what to do when stopped by the police, have to prepare them to be safe against the people that I respect and work with and wore the same uniform I did. That conflict has been something I struggled with for 30 years on how to reconcile it. And I've found a way to reconcile it, which I think the governor's leading the state to do. You don't reconcile it by trying to fit them into a safe narrative. You don't reconcile it by ignoring the truth or history. You accept each for the truth that they represent and you move forward. And I think that's what we need to do here. I also spent 30 years as a cop, as the, as the governor mentioned. So that perspective has meaning to me. I'm proud in this, to work as a cop. 
and I, I can't think of no more noble profession or the group of men and women that I work with are so honorable, courageous. Um, and I spent 20 years in the beautiful and diverse city of Oakland. And then I spent close to nine years as a police chief in the equally beautiful and diverse city of East Palo Alto. And those close to 30 years taught me that police, when operating appropriately, can make a difference. And then I also spent three and a half years in the Obama administration, as the governor mentioned, to be able to work with the thousands of police departments. There's over 16,000 police departments in the United States, local, state, county, and tribal. And as a director of the COPS office, I have to work with a lot of them. It included going to Ferguson, going to Baltimore, working with San Francisco Police Department with their collaborative reform. We even did an after action review of Ferguson to understand what went right and what went wrong. The 50 caliber weapons, the militarization of the police. So we know there's roadmaps out there. When Michael Brown was killed following that tragedy, President Obama created the President's Task Force in 21st Century Policing. And I had the honor of serving as the executive director and traveled around the country with the task force with listening sessions, listening to experts and victims and families and academics and union and police officers and sheriffs, everyone trying to identify what are the best methods moving forward. I appreciate the governor's stance. We don't have time to relitigate the causes. We know the causes. The governor outlined some of them today. What we need to do is focus on the remedies and to move forward so that we turn all these plans that do exist into actions. So for me, I was there doing Rodney King as a cop. I was there doing Freddie Gray in the Obama administration. Each one was a certain moment. I do believe that this is a movement. And I'll close with a, with a call to my fellow law enforcement leaders. In the 60s, we have evidence and videos and we celebrate some of the, some of the courageous actions of civil rights people that, wanted, that stood against the oppression that we provided them as police officers whether it was the Edmund Pettus Bridge, whether it was demonstrations. And we, our job was to oppress and to stop the, ex, the expression of First Amendment rights. In 2020, we have now come to the point where our job should be to protect the civil rights and to the First, protection, the First Amendment rights so that people can protest in peace. There's only two types of protest we should not accept, and that's silence and violence. And silence does no one any good, and violence is just unacceptable. So what I tell my, my law enforcement leaders, I will call to action as we move forward with this, that we will be getting a hold of you, that we will be collaborating with you. We need time for you to stand up. I've saw a lot of chiefs take a knee, and that is great, but now take a stance, and take a stance for systemic reform and changes. I saw a lot of people say they want to make changes, but this is the opportunity. Let's make this movement not against the police. Let's do it with the police so that we can make changes about our systems that everyone benefits. I look forward to, you heard the passionate speakings of Latif, and I look forward to working with my colleagues and under the leadership of the, uh, of the governor. I think we can actually get some things done that will not only make policing practices better in California, it will help start changing the culture of policing as a profession. And I agree with everyone that says, when California does something, the nation does follow. So it is, a, it is an honor to actually be able to help the governor's effort. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Latifah. And, and I, let me just build on Ron's comments because I think they're important to underscore at the same time. As a former police officer himself, as someone who recognized and deserves to be recognized, police officers, not just chiefs uh, of all stripes all across this country. You see images of police officers dancing with protesters, bending down on one knee with protesters. Members of our own National Guard, not just cleaning up graffiti, here in Northern California, but in Southern California, a whole crew bending down on one knee uh, in solidarity with the protesters. Uh, there is so much nobility to those men and women as well that need to be recognized at this moment. Uh, I know firsthand the courageousness uh, of many in law enforcement, overwhelming number of our men and women in uniform that go to work every single day to do justice to this collective cause of making more gentle the life of our world. And they're as horrified uh, by what is happening as anybody. That includes California Highway Patrol, it includes uh, all the men and women of law enforcement across the spectrum, deputy sheriffs, uh, as well as members of local law enforcement. So I want to distinguish uh, the principles that we're trying to advance uh, as a collective cause in the spirit of what I think brings Ron uh, to the forefront of leadership 
uh, is that recognition. There's that old African proverb, we cannot quote it enough, that if you want to go fast, you can go alone, but if you want to go far in the cause of justice, you've got to go together. And when we signed 392 and 230 last year, we did that in the spirit of collaboration and cooperation. We didn't agree on every issue, but we didn't come at it with closed fists, with open hearts and hands, and we worked together with law enforcement to advance the most significant use of force, deadly use of force uh, provisions of any state in this nation. And I believe that is the spirit uh, that brings Ron uh, to his leadership position, brings Latifa uh, here today, and certainly that's the spirit we'll carry forward. And it's also the spirit of collaboration, not just with those in positions of formal authority, but others uh, that are exercising not just formal authority, but moral authority, like the leaders of the Black Caucus in the California legislature, the Latino caucus and others that we look forward to working with uh, on a legislative package of reforms. And I want to thank all the leaders of the Black Caucus in the state of California uh, for their incredible stewardship, their capacity uh, of leadership that's demonstrable by the work that they've been doing for years and years uh, over the course uh, of not only their careers, uh, but over the course particularly uh, of the last 12 months where historic number of bills were advanced because of their uh, example and their support. And we need that collaboration. We need their example, their voice uh, at this moment uh, as well. Final point, because it's important, uh, Ron made uh, about the issue of silence. I want to encourage those of us that um, are prone to silence at this moment uh, to consider not just Ron's words, uh, but to consider Dante's words. Dante infamously said that the hottest place in hell is reserved for those in a time of moral crisis that maintain their neutrality. This is not a time to be neutral. It's not about picking sides. It's about recognizing that the conditions that led to this moment cannot persist. We cannot be neutral about that. 